How does the jewelry market look like under the destruction of the pandemic? Are there any rising trends in the jewelry market? And also, is there classification between different price ranges of jewelry, like fine jewelry, luxury jewelry, ultra high jewelry? You'll find all that out in this episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fashion Brief. As some of my subscribers left some comments under my video stating that they are interested in jewelry-related topics, and here it is. I would like to start firstly with the jewelry market, the status quo of the market, and also some trends to kickstart of the jewelry-related topics. And also last month, the business of fashion launched a report about jewelry and watch. I found it super interesting, so I would definitely want to share with you guys about the highlights of this report. That is to say, next episode will be about watches. So please stay tuned. Well, first of all, let's take a look at the classification of jewelry. And the classification I'm going to share is based on the business of fashion report. And also, it's mainly differentiated by price. So there are three levels. The first level, premium jewelry. The second level, luxury jewelry. And then the highest level, ultra luxury or high jewelry. And the price range of premium jewelry ranged from 360 till 1,800 US dollar. For luxury jewelry, the price ranged from 1,800 till 36,000 US dollar. And then the high jewelry is above 36,000 US dollar. And of course, there are also branded and unbranded jewelry in the market. So according to the statistics of McKinsey and company, the overall fine jewelry market takes up to global annual sale of 280 billion US dollar in 2019. However, due to COVID, there is a decline of 10 to 15% of the fine jewelry market. And when it comes to profitability of jewelry brands, it's typically higher than watch brands. For example, Richelbon's specialist watchmaker division, the average EBIT margin, so-called earning before interest and taxes, between 2002 till 2016 was 20%, whereas it was 29% of Richemont's jewelry maison division. And so here we can see that the difference, and I will explain it a little bit more later why jewelry brands can have a better margin than watch brands. Despite the extreme COVID situation, according to the estimation of the report, the global branded fine jewelry market is still expected to grow significantly in the coming years with the lead of Asia market. And here from this graph, you can see the total branded fine jewelry market is expected to grow from an 8 to 12% of compound annual growth rate till 2025. And from the geographic region, here you can see at the top, Asia is going to lead the overall growth from 10 to 14 percent. And from the overall growth of 8 to 12 percent estimated from 2019 till 2025, in another graph you can see the luxury jewelry category has the highest potential among the three categories. So let's take a look at the trend in the fine jewelry market. And there were three trends mentioned in the report. Firstly, the rise of branded jewelry. Namely, consumers started to buy branded jewelry. And now you might wonder, it's quite strange because there are plenty of big jewelry players such as Cartier, Bulgari, The Beers, etc. They have really strong brand identity and also wide global reach. However, the fact is that the sales of branded jewelry only accounts for 20% of the overall market. 
And from this chart, you can clearly see that the unbranded fine jewelry is still dominating the whole market. And what is the difference between branded and unbranded fine jewelry? The answer is quite easy. It's price. As I've mentioned before, the profitability of jewelry is higher than watches. It's mainly because the equivalent piece of branded fine jewelry can demand prices up to six times higher than the unbranded fine jewelry. And what is the reason that consumers tended to choose branded fine jewelry instead of unbranded fine jewelry? And also why branded jewelry is more expensive than unbranded jewelry? The reason lies in the added value that branded jewelry provides to the consumer. There are plenty of reasons. For example, the design, the craftsmanship, and also its history. And because it's a brand, so it owns its own brand trust. And the storytelling that makes consumers to buy in the story and then to relate to the product. The emotional connection, and also, last but not least, the in-store experience. These are all the reasons why consumers tended to choose branded fine jewelry. And also the reason why these fine jewelries are more expensive than those without brands. And there are three types of layers that are expected to convert customers from unbranded to branded jewelry. Namely established fine jewelry brands, new and growing direct to consumer, so to say DTC brands and luxury fashion brands. And these types of players have different strategy in order to penetrate the market. And so for established fine jewelry brands such as Cartier, Boucheron or Chomet, they are the existing luxury jewelry brands in the luxury industry for a really long time. And so what they should do is to leverage their scale and also what I've mentioned in the 24 anti-laws of marketing rule to remind the consumers that they are the jewelry brands to shop for, to enhance the concept of craftsmanship and their great history. And also, it's really important for them to enhance the in-store experience to the customers. And for the new and growing direct-to-consumer brands, such as Bashi or Mejuri, these brands usually have close relationship with their customers. The main reason is that they control their own channel. Namely, they can have direct communication and contact to their customers. And so this is quite clear that they should definitely set a clear value proposition to have intimate contact with the customer and also provide bespoke fine jewelry design. And also for this kind of business model is quite nimble. They can do a lot of flexible strategy in comparison to the luxury fine jewelry brands such as digital brand building tools, influencers, in order to quickly target their target audience. And for luxury fashion brand players such as Hermé, Giorgio Armani, Louis Vuitton, or even Gucci, these brands are having jewelry in their product portfolio, but not the main focus. And so nowadays, more and more, these kind of luxury fashion brands realize that fine jewelry can be one of the highest growth among the all product line. And so they started to revigorate the jewelry product line. These luxury fashion brands are already famous and having a good reputation in the luxury industry. So I would say chances are high that they can succeed by launching their own jewelry collection. But what they need to do is that they should leverage the brand heritage and also adding elements to their jewelry collection to make consumers relate. And from an interview of CEO of Hong Kong jewelry brand Shou Dafu, he mentioned that they already partnered with a Hong Kong startup company called Goldway Technology to use AI for diamond grading. And so they actually don't need to train a gemologist 
for grading a color or the quality of the diamond, but rather to use machine learning to make it in a more scientific way. The next trend, it's online presence. Let's take a look at this chart. According to the report, there will be a 9 to 12% increase of the global online finder resales from 2019 till 2025. And so it's quite promising for jewelry players that they should definitely embrace online and also digital. And now you might wonder why it is so hard for jewelry players to adopt online or digital tools. The main reason lies in not only that they belong to the luxury industry, but also the buying experience is very important throughout the jewelry buying process that connected emotionally and also involves a lot of consultation about fitting, about the story of this piece, and also the features of the gemstones or diamonds. And so that's the reason why for jewelry players, they put great emphasis on in-store experiences instead of adopting online. And due to COVID situation, consumers can't actually go to the stores and it actually triggers the online transformation of jewelry market. And we can see plenty of interesting examples such as Cartier launched a live streaming show on Chinese e-commerce Taobao during Alibaba's shopping festival last year. And also they leverage 3D printing to scan the customer's head and also neck to boost their custom-made pieces. And also some other examples that we can also see from the luxury fashion brands such as augmented reality try-on and also virtual appointments. These are also adopted in the jewelry industry. Well, despite the fact that online presence is more and more important in the jewelry market, we also can't deny that in-store experience is irreplaceable. And so for jewelry players, it's crucial for them to find the right blend, the right balance between technology and brick and mortar stores. It's very important to know the aim of their online channels, namely to clarify or to analyze the situation of their existing channels. What are they going to do with specific channels? Are they going to pr only promote something or are they also going to have online appointments with their customers? And it's crucial to have a human touch in the digital channel. It doesn't mean that with digital presence, they can be cold. They should always think about their in-store experience, the emotional connection with their customers. And I really like this sentence in the report. Digital offers significant potential to find jewelry brands, but only if they engage with imagination, commitment, and an open mind. The last trend, sustainability. By the way, I made already two episodes about sustainability. If you haven't checked it out, I put the link in the description. And so since the blood diamond scandal in 1990s, all the jewelry players started to be careful about their sourcing. For example, most jewelry players use Kimberly process diamonds to ensure that they are not having conflict diamonds. And with the rise of sustainable mindsets and sustainable issues throughout the world, jewelry players started to put emphasis on ethical and also environmental friendly jewelries. And also 9 out of 10 Generation Z consumers think that companies should take the responsibility to address the environmental and social issues. And why sustainability in jewelry market? I would like to show you some hard facts. 250 tons of earth are shifted for every carat of diamond extracted. And also gold mining generates 20 tons of waste for every nine grams of gold mined, with mining companies dumping 180 million tons of hazardous waste into water streams every year. And now what consumers want for the jewelry players is the traceability of resources and also recyclable or sustainable material. 
For luxury jewelry brand Tiffany and Co, they started to use recycled gold, and also they established its own chain of custody controls, and thus they become the first global jewelers to control and to disclose their country of origin of diamond resources. And also, they set up science-based emission reduction targets since February 2021. And in another example. The Denmark jewelry player Pandora, the company is actually the world's largest jewelry manufacturer from production value, has said recycled gold and silver will be used in all its products by 2025. For all in all, when speaking of sustainability, cost comes to the mind of all jewelry brands, because it's inevitable to increase the cost and adjust the pricing, even reduce the margin. If they act sustainably, however, when speaking of a longer term, it's definitely the direction and also the trend for the whole industry. And so, I think jewelry brands should be ready and also to re-estimate what they should act and what they should use for their products. So that's the episode of jewelry market and also trends. Please remember to give me a thumbs up and also subscribe my channel Fashion Brief, and stay tuned to the next episode because these two episodes are connected. The next episode will be about the watch market and its trend. See you soon.